Okay, well last week I talked about artificial intelligence and how scary that is getting and how that relates to us as Christians. I hope you enjoyed the message, but I know that the message could just create in some ways uncertainty and fear in us. I believe that we need to be informed. Uh, we need to know what's coming down the pipe at us, but I, uh, we must always remember something, church, that God is not afraid. God is actually in control, and whatever is coming down at us is part of his plan as well. God has given us his word and his Holy Spirit to guide and empower us for this very day that we live in. Amen? God, and I thought about this, God has chosen you and I to live in this day and hour. And he trusts us, he trusts you, church, to do his will and accomplish his purposes, no matter what's happening all around us. And we need to remember that we are his people chosen to by him to do his will in this day. We read often about all the great saints of old in the Bible, but also in the history books. And what we need to remember is that God is saying to us now, your time is now to step up and to stand firm, but also represent me, bring my, uh, my truth and my gospel to the world. So as I was praying about what to preach on this Sunday, what I actually think he said to me is to talk about what God is doing here on, it seems like, almost every Sunday. What I think that means is many people, both longtime members and new people, have said this to me over the last while, that it's the presence of or we might call it the anointing of the Holy Spirit that we are sensing when we gather together. It's not my great sermons, although I think they are great. <laughs> it is not even our great worship, although I think that we have great worship teams and people. It is how the Holy Spirit is tangibly present as we gather and worship together. Now I want to be careful here because this can be subjective. What some people think is the Holy Spirit might be emotion created by skilled worship or even it could be hype that is in preaching. And over the years I've seen people justify unbiblical ideas and actions because they felt like the Holy Spirit was guiding them or leading them. I've seen people support, for instance, same-sex marriage because they just felt like it was what the Holy Spirit was saying was the right thing to do. Or people embrace something called universalism, which is universal salvation. Everybody is going to get saved because that's what felt good or right to them. I've even had people say that they need to leave their spouse because God is telling them that he wants them to be happy. So we have to be careful a little bit about just what we're sensing or what we're feeling. So I'm not talking about feelings alone, although we also have to not go on the other side of this, which is, you know, it has nothing to do with feelings. If the Holy Spirit is here, you will feel Him. Amen? If the Spirit comes, you have joy, you have life. And I'm going to talk about that today. So it's not about, it's not, about not feeling something, but we can't just trust feelings. What I'm talking about is a collective sense of even the holiness of God. And it's the holiness of God accompanied by a sense of His grace, His love, His mercy and forgiveness. I'm talking about demonstrations of His power, people being healed. I want to let all of you know I just had my most recent CAT scan a couple days ago. And uh, I am still, after a full year, completely cancer-free, which they didn't think would be so you know just keep going with that Lord and that's a good thing and so we prayed lots and all of you prayed lots about that so that's awesome 
And we, but it's not just me. We've seen healings in other people. We've seen God's power come in the midst of our services. And we've also seen in our rhema spaces consistent and confirmed words that have been, you know, one person gets a word, another person comes up and says, that's exactly what God was showing me. And so we see that happening. But I also sense a joy, a this is almost, we, we feel God's love, but I don't know about you guys, but how many of you, when we're gathered together, feel a greater and greater love for God coming in you? You know, and I think that's a powerful thing when we begin to experience, if coming here makes you want to love God more, that's a good thing. And that's not us, that's the Spirit of God in our midst. Amen. Now, here's a critical thing for us to understand. We cannot manufacture this. Okay? God is the one who brings it. God, it's his presence. And, I, and I've felt this for a long time. You know, we can come, and if I can give you a good sermon, all that's good. And if we have a great, you know, day, and you laugh, and there's humor and all kinds of you'll feel good about it. But that's not the purpose of this. What I want people to do when they come to the Camel River Vineyard is I want them to be, in one sense, experienced and also confronted, in one, not in a bad way, but with the presence of the living God. When we come together, God comes here and he shows up. And you know there's something different happening in that little place. Amen? So we can't make it happen. However, we can do things that create an environment that is conducive to the presence of the Holy Spirit. And when I say the presence of the Holy Spirit, you know, don't get all worked up. You know, we all have the presence of the Holy Spirit all the time. Yes, we do. I'm talking about the manifest presence, that sense that we have when we just feel God all around us. And he comes here and is in and amongst us in a tangible way. So I'm talking about what can we do. There are things that we can do that create an environment conducive to the presence of the Holy Spirit. Things like, for instance, asking for his presence to come. That seems sim simple enough, but the Bible says you have not because... You ask not, so we want to ask him, Holy Spirit, that's what Wimber did. You know, Holy Spirit, come. That's what he meant by that. Secondly, we want to give room for the Holy Spirit to move in our services. Uh, you know, the scripture that comes to mind is, do not forbid prophecy or put out the Spirit's fire. So the, the truth is, there are churches that forbid prophecy, and there are churches that are, you know, maybe they don't like the prophecy and tongues and all those things, and they do sometimes put out the Spirit's fire. Now, I'm not here this morning to complain about any other church, though. Let's get that off the table right away. But we know that this is something that's possible because Paul warns us not to do it. And finally, we need to not grieve the Holy Spirit, and I think that can happen through unforgiveness, through division in our body. If we begin to hate and bite at one another, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. And also uh, unrepentant sin that's in the camp, so to speak, or in our lives can cause uh, gr the Holy Spirit to be grieved. Now, there's one thing I will say about grieving the Holy Spirit, though. That doesn't necessarily mean the Holy Spirit is gone you think about it, if somebody, you know, if your child is sinning or doing something wrong, does it grieve you? Yes. Do you abandon them? No. So the Holy Spirit doesn't abandon us when he's grieved, but we can sense when he's grieved. And so, now that would be a great sermon if we looked at all those things today, but we're not going to do that. Maybe next week. Today I'm going to talk about why we should long for and expect his presence in our services, which is the purpose. What is the purpose, for, for instance, of his presence and how that relates to us reaching the lost, to, doing, to accomplishing the purposes of God? Now, to do this, we're going to look at Isaiah, which prophesies a new thing that God is going to do. 
And Jesus talks about this in Luke chapter 4, so let's start there. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 4, 16 to 21. And it says this, He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, or on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, scroll he gave it back to the attendants and sat down and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened upon him and he began by saying to them today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing now jesus quotes isaiah 61 here to in one sense ex uh, explain his mission which by extension church is our mission this mission of Jesus from Isaiah 61 continues through you and I, and it includes preaching the gospel to the poor. And by the poor, he meant the poor both materially and spiritually. So rich people can be very poor, and they need the gospel. It means setting the prisoners free, those held captive by sin or by fear, or even by those who oppress them. It means opening blind eyes. It means healing the sick and proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor. And that refers to the year of Jubilee. And if you know your Bibles, the year of Jubilee was the year of forgiving debts and restoration of property and restoration with one another and ultimately with God. That is what we proclaim. However, we need to see what the text starts with. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and He has anointed me. Now, I remember a sermon by a vineyard theologian named Don Williams, where he said that if Jesus' church needed the infilling of the Holy Spirit in order to do that ministry, why in the world would we think we can do it without the Holy Spirit? And he was at the time lamenting because he had gone to uh, a museum in the States that had been set up sort of in... Uh, it, it was like um, about all the great evangelists throughout history. And uh, what he lamented was nowhere in that museum did it say anything about the infilling of the Holy Spirit upon those leaders? And if you think about it, you know, John Knox and different from the Presbyterians for the Mennonites to the Great Awakening to Billy Graham himself, all of them, before they ever began their ministry in evangelism, had an encounter and an infilling of the Holy Spirit. And he was lamenting that when he said this very thing. Pastor Hoff, I hope, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but him and I were talking, and he was telling me that he really senses the anointing of the Holy Spirit in our services, and he was quoting someone who was talking to him. I don't remember the name of the person, but this person said, you know, I don't know how to explain what the anointing is. I just know what it's like if it's not there. And again, I want to be cautious about judging on feelings alone. But I think we all know what he is saying. The difference between dead religion and the life-changing power and presence of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, church, brings life. That is what Jesus said about himself. The thief comes to steal and destroy, but I have come to give life, and that more abundantly. But the abundant life is the Spirit-filled life. It is, in one sense, the awake life. If we're slumbering, it's the Spirit that awakens us. Our spirits were dead when we're born from above. Then His Spirit comes into us, but it also 
sparks the life of our spirit. It brings our spirit back to life again. The spirit-filled life is when you feel fully alive. And I want us then to look at Isaiah 61 for a moment. Let's look at Isaiah 61 that Jesus quotes and get a fuller picture of what he was preaching on. So Isaiah 61 says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and to release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor, and they will rebuild, church, the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. And they will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Now again, it's the spirit of the sovereign Lord that empowers Jesus and us to preach the good news. It's the Spirit of the Lord that empowers us to bind the brokenhearted. It's the Spirit of the Lord that helps us to set the captives free. It's the Spirit of the Lord that empowers us to comfort those who mourn. And this idea of bestowing a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Well, ashes is what you put on your head when you were in mourning. And so instead of mourning, you're going to have a crown of beauty upon your head. It's the Spirit who actually is the oil of gladness. The Spirit gives us a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And I want you to not miss the language, the language of Spirit. A spirit of despair. And what happens is the Spirit of God will replace that spirit of despair with a spirit of praise. Amen? Secondly, it says that we are oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the glory of God. We become people who bear the fruit of the Spirit. This image in Isaiah is very important, and it's all through the book of Isaiah. It's the language of streams and rivers flowing into a desert, a dry and dusty land, and bringing life wherever it flows. This is the language of the Spirit. And we are trees who have been planted by the streams so that our roots go down and drink from that river. We cannot become the oaks of righteousness, church, without our roots being nourished by the river of God. Are you with me? Let me show you from Isaiah 43, 18 to 21. And this is the text that I really want you to get this morning. It says this, Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a, what does it say? A new thing. Now it springs up. Do, not, do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland. I give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. That's you and me. In Isaiah 44, 3 and 4, it says, For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. Then he says this, and this is what I really want you to get, to know that all this imagery in Isaiah is all about the Spirit. I will pour out my Spirit on my offspring and my blessing on your descendants. 
and they will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. God is doing a new thing. It will not be like the past. And that new thing, if we understand Scripture, culminates at Pentecost. Yes, it, it all is centered on what Christ does and that he has both died for our sins and rose again to prove that he had overcome death. But 50 days later, which is coming up fairly soon, 50 days later, the church is born through the coming of the promised Holy Spirit upon the people of God. So this new thing culminates in Pentecost, and we, church, live in the post-Pentecost age of the Holy Spirit. We live now in this time in which the Holy Spirit is here amongst us for the very purpose of empowering and filling us with the life that I just talked about. How many of you feel like you have that life? How many of you feel like that? And I'm going to tell you right now, some of you, yes, I do. Others, I'm not so sure. What I want you to be encouraged today is that this is the promise. This is what you can have and you're meant to have. Amen? And this is the new thing. This new thing is like life-giving streams of water in a desert land. And I'll say this, we in the West with our plumbed-in running water do not really understand how critical to life water really is. Because we actually never have to be without it. I do remember a time when the water main in Camp River broke a number of years ago. Remember that? There was this main water line, and we, we suddenly didn't have any running water in our house for, a, for about a week. You know, and we were like trying to figure out where we were going to get buckets. We were buying bottles of water, storing it in our house, filling our toilets with it. You know? Think about it. You can't flush your toilet without water. And yet, because we can just turn the tap on 99% of the time, we don't really think too much about it. We take it for granted, right? But in a desert country where water is scarce, they understand these passages much better than we do. In Africa, for instance, they constantly go through seasons of drought and waiting with anticipation for the rainy season to arrive. And when it finally comes, it's a time of intense celebration, not only for the people, but for all life within the region. When we read about the jackals and the owls and all this stuff, the whole animal kingdom in Africa just seems to relax once the rains come. But here on the BC West Coast, we can't imagine celebrating rain. <laughs> we complain about it. We don't celebrate it, but I imagine if it was suddenly gone, you watch how much we would miss it, we would cherish it. Hutalco, where Nancy and I were just on holidays, it's way down kind of at the bottom of Mexico near Central America, and it is dry there. And although it was green and lush all around the resort areas where they watered everything, if you looked past that, everything else was brown and dry. And one of the telltale factors was that when you looked up to see all the birds that were flying around, the greatest number of birds were black with big wings and red heads flying in circles right above the pool waiting for us to die. Anyway. <laughs> We had a couple of vultures that would actually come down right to the pool and they would sit on the, on the little railing around it. And you'd have to come over there and kind of shoo them away, but they, didn't, they weren't waiting for us to die. They could see we were, they could see we were getting fatter, not skinnier. Uh, but but they, would get, they would go and drink the pool water because it was the only water they could see for miles. So they're drinking chlorinated water, these big vultures hanging around. Anyway, 
they wait, and the rainy season was coming, though, and they do have a rainy season down there. And they told us, some of the locals told us, once the rains come, everything that you see that's brown becomes green. But it becomes green for a little while, and then the summer comes again, and it dries out. What Isaiah is saying is that when God sends his Holy Spirit, the whole world should celebrate like a desert does when the rains finally come. Amen? So when the Holy Spirit is moving in our midst, we all feel that life. It makes all the difference. The Spirit breathes life into our worship times. The Spirit breathes life into the message. The Spirit will breathe life into the ministry that happens after but one of the things we need to be wary about is relegating the Spirit to what happens inside this building. Throughout Israel's history, the temple was the focal point of Jewish worship. The temple is the place where God's Spirit was present. Every once in a while, God would pour out His Spirit on an individual in a specific time, in a specific place, for a specific purpose. But the Spirit's main dwelling place was in the temple. If you wanted to go and visit God, you went to the temple. People would come from all over the known world to go to the temple of God and to meet with God. And in some ways, we continue to kind of model that by coming. We come to church, and I, I believe in coming to church, believe me. Don't not come because of this message. But, but that's not what's going on. That's not the new thing that God is doing. Here's what I'm getting at. Isaiah is saying things are going to change. And remember that he is prophesying that Jerusalem is actually going to be destroyed, that Israel will be taken into captivity. He prophesies about them going into captivity by the Assyrians, but also the Babylonians. God's Spirit cannot be contained in the temple or in a building, especially not in here. But it was always God's plan to place His Holy Spirit in His people. Because we are now the temple. We are meant to become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I think that Isaiah 58 is foreshadowing that idea. Let's read Isaiah 58 together, 11 to 12. It says, The Lord will guide you always. Always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. He will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden. Like a spring, okay, whose waters never fail. This is what you and I are meant to be like. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations, and you will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. I want you to see the language that the Lord will guide you always. God's guiding Holy Spirit will be with us always. We will be well-watered gardens, a spring that never fails. And because of this, we can rebuild the ancient ruins. We can repair the broken walls. Now, I know that Isaiah is prophesying the immediate context of this is rebuilding Jerusalem. But it is also a picture, I think, of us as God's people today. We are part of Israel, according to Paul. And we rebuild the age-old foundations in the broken lives of the world around us. And that term, age-old foundations, to me, is so important. What does our world need more than anything what are they rejecting? They're rejecting the age-old foundations. All of our institutions, they want to reject. We want to deconstruct the whole world around us. But does God, does God deconstruct the whole world around him all the time? Especially when it comes to his truth and his word? No. 
what I think our world needs is to embrace a very old foundation. And what is that foundation? God and his word, the Bible, but the gospel of Jesus Christ. The very thing that formed our civilization, the very thing that is the foundation of all that's good about our society is what they're rejecting. And yet you and I, empowered by the Holy Spirit, are meant to do what? Rebuild the age-old foundations. We're called to rebuild those foundations. But it doesn't happen just in here. In order for us to rebuild those foundations, what do we need to do? We need to go out there. Because that's where they're all falling down. Amen? And all of this happens in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. The new thing God is doing is to change the focal point of worship from the temple to the human heart. True worshipers will worship in spirit, in spirit and in truth. God is taking up residence within us. And the picture I want you to envision is this. In the past, people would stream into the temple to meet with God and to be restored to God. But now, God is on the move. God is on the move inside each and every one of us. The temple is actually moving from here. And what you are is you are the temple, but you are think of yourself carrying not just a bucket of water, but actually a spring of water. You now are the one that's carrying the water, and so when it says that there's these streams going through a dry and dusty land, rivers that begin to go and give life everywhere, that's us filled with the Holy Spirit. That is not us if we don't have the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit within us, though. But that's the picture. We are called to go out. Amen? Streams are flowing into the desert. The water that is meant to worship the dry and barren lands is in us. We carry that water into the desert and dry places. And we somehow need to not just give room for the Spirit to move here in church, but we need church to be watching and listening and asking for the Spirit to move and empower us out there. Amen? Amen. Okay, what I want to do now is actually let the Holy Spirit move. So I'm, I actually have a song that I wrote. And uh, I'm debating whether to sing it to you. You guys want, <laughs> you want me to sing it? Okay, we're going to sing it. Now I'm going to, um, I was going to play it on my guitar. So... It's, I have to play it on my guitar because my guitar is the only one that knows how to play country music. So, I hope it's in tune. Forgive him, Lord. He knoweth not what he says. Well, let's see if I can do this here. I'm trying to figure out how not to be sitting on this, this thing. So, yeah, well. Now, this song, wow, I am getting old. I can't read it. <laughs> This song is a song that I wrote. I need somebody's. Okay, I'm going to unplug Leslie. I'll plug me in. And I, one of the things that they say uh, is a sign that the Spirit is moving is new music starts to come out. I'm a little worried if the new music is coming from me, though. <laughs> but this is a song 
all about the rivers of the streams going into the desert. It's called As the Waters Cover the Ocean. May we all 